Hi, I'm Rick Thigpen. At Public Service, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important economic and environmental issues that affect their communities. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. Johnson & Johnson, NJM Insurance Group, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, RWJ Barnabas Health, The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, and by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. Welcome to Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato coming to you from the Agnes Ferris NJTV studio. We're welcoming, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Winslow, president and co-founder of an organization called Students to Science, which is? Students to Science is a non-for-profit that uh, focuses on inspiring, motivating, and educating elementary, middle, and, and high school students. Good stuff. By the way, this entire edition of uh, Think Tank focuses on young people. What we need to do to help them be the best they can be. Uh, it's also part of our innovation series, so I'm curious about this. Why is teaching STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, engineering and math so important for really young kids? Well, I think it's it's so important for <clears throat> excuse me, it's so important for everybody. Um, scientific literacy, especially today in our society, where we're such a technology advanced or technology driven society. So, but when you talk about kids and 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 improving their scientific literacy, it's important to start them at an early age uh, in the educational process because unlike many other careers, science has to build on something. It has to build on the basics. It has to build on reading, writing, and arithmetic, okay? And so there has to be this certain amount of educational rigor, and introducing it young and building on it is, uh, is the most effective How does that help that. the nation? How's that helped the nation? Is that we, uh, you know, it's the only way we'll be able to compete globally in this economy. Well, break, break that down. What what does teaching young people more about science, having them be more literate, if you will, science science literate, as you said, technologically savvy, and I don't just mean being able to mess around with a with a pad. Why does that help? The, how does that actually help our country and our society? Um, as we all know, and as, as it, it, you know, the, there's a deficiency in scientists um, to fuel the economy that we have currently, especially here in the state. New Jersey is a technologically advanced state, um, home to just about every type of technology, believe, you know, starting with pharmaceuticals all the way to, you know, computer programming and electronics and communications. And so uh, it's important for us to be able to provide a pipeline mm. or a pathway to those needed careers. That's where the jobs are. That's where the jobs are. Let's do this, by the way, as we're, folks, as we're talking to Dr. Winslow, I'm going to do this, ask our team to put up um, this Twitter uh, feed, if you will, their Twitter account, my Twitter account. I'll tell you why. One of the things about Think Tank that's particularly exciting to all of us here in public broadcasting and our partners on the commercial side as well is that Think Tank tries to look at issues, topics, that are often ignored in the media, not given enough attention to. So look at that Twitter feed, excuse me, the, my Twitter account. Write to me, I'll share with our producers, a topic that you think we should be looking at, something that's not getting enough attention, that's not just New Jersey regional, but national in scope, that affects everyone in society, society, if you will. That is why we're talking about this. Let me go back to this, doctor. So. Teaching science, technology, engineering, and math, particularly in underserved communities. We're taping in Newark, New Jersey, Brick City, right here where NJTV is. Why is that especially important? So if you take a look at, at New Jersey, historically, New Jersey has done a pretty good job in sending kids from, uh, graduating them from high school, sending them off to college to pursue careers in, in the STEM disciplines. But when you take a look at the, uh, you know, at, at that, 
most of those uh, students will get those degrees, but they'll never come back to the state, okay? So one of the things is, is that, number one, we have a very high population of underserved um, students in, a, in our school districts, okay? But if we take those kids and we can help them get through high school, graduate, right then and there we've increased their earnings potential mm -hmm. by 2x. If we can get those kids to pursue an associate's degree or a specialty degree at one of the vocational schools so they can go into the healthcare industry, we can, you know, we can raise their earnings potentials north of, of $50,000. If we can get them to stay and get a bachelor's degree and a PhD, then it's endless for them. But more importantly, most of those students will stay right here in the state and fuel the economy and supply the next generation of uh, workers that the companies such as uh, the healthcare companies and the pharmaceutical and the biotech and the engineering firms need to stay here in New Jersey. So what is this Newark Technology Center? So, Currently, S2S has two technology centers. Our, our first S2S one, Students to Science. Students to Science. Our first one and our uh, home base is in East Hanover. Um, and that one services anybody in commutable distance. Um, we also have a virtual laboratory program that you know, erases the geographic uh, barriers. But one of the things that we're doing is trying to build a replicable model, a national model that we can roll out statewide and nationally. So what we've done is we've come over here to Newark and we've built a 10,000 square foot facility right on Broad Street. It's embedded right in the Newark public school system. It is integrated right into the curriculum. It's written right into their 10 year plan for STEM education. So what it is, is it's a shared facility for all of the 60 plus schools within the district. What will it do for those young people? What it does for those young people is the virtual laboratory starts them in the fifth grade, gets them the skills, gets them inspired, gets them motivated to want to pursue more scientific courses. It is compliant with the next gen science standards, so it's a help to the teachers, it's a help to the district, okay? And then what it does is it starts them on a pathway. They can participate in that program in the fifth grade, the sixth grade, and then in the seventh and eighth grade, they can physically come into mm -hmm. the 10,000 square foot laboratory and work side by side with professional scientists. Doc, you see this as a national model. I do. This isn't simply a local or New Jersey issue. Education is a big problem. When I started this 10 years ago, I started it as kind of a transition for me. I had just sold a company and, you know, and I had a personal interest in education. And so I started it. But I realized very soon that if you're going to play in education, if you're going to try to tackle educational problems, you need scale and scope. So that is, you know, what we've grown scale to. Scale and scope meaning a bigger impact. Take what you're doing and not just do it in one community, but spread it out. That's right. You know, we started the first year. We did 300 kids approximately. Last year we did, you know, up to now it's 66,000. Next year it could be as many as 100,000 students. You've been listening to Dr. Paul Winslow. Uh, this is an important initiative. This isn't just Newark. It isn't just uh, suburban communities in New Jersey. It's New Jersey, it's region, and it's national in scope. He is the president, co-founder of an organization called Science, excuse me, Students to Science. Now, Dr. Winslow, I want to thank you for joining us on Think Tank. As I always say, you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you very much. Stay right there. I'm Steve Arvado. This is Think Tank, and we'll be right back. To see more Think Tank with Steve Adubato programs and to listen to Think Tank with Steve Adubato, the podcast, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to welcome Carol Ann Giardelli, director of Safe Kids, New Jersey, also a Central Jersey Family Consortium, Health Consortium. Good to see you. Thank you. You were on with us. You were on with us a while back. Yes, we're talking about trying to keep our kids safe. Absolutely. Tell everyone what your organization does. Well, Safe Kids is actually a, a worldwide nonprofit dedicated to preventing injuries to children. It's the number one way that kids die in this country and in the world, just through injuries. And they could ninety percent of them could be prevented. What can be prevented? By the way, we're making sure your website is up so people can find out more. Go ahead. Great. Um, what could be prevented are the leading killers of kids, and they basically fall into several categories, falls, traffic, 
crashes, uh, poisoning, drowning, and fires and burns. Those are the leading ways that children get hurt. Let's be more specific about prevention. What are some of the, I don't want to say easier, because nothing's easy, the smartest things for okay. parents to do? Well, there's some tangible solutions that are ready for all of us, hopefully, such as simple things like walking around the, your entire car before you back out of the driveway. Little things that we try to make people aware of. Um, uh, obviously wearing safety belts, using car seats, bike helmets. For some people, those solutions may not be tangible. They, not, they may not be readily available to them. Uh, there are intangible solutions, such as active supervision, uh, making sure that you set the example for your child and practicing safety rules within so your home. So interesting. I don't like to disclose this, but I will. I was riding bikes with our daughter the other day, and she, I made sure she had her helmet on. Did you have yours on? No. Yeah. And I shouldn't say that, but yeah. I'm going to be honest yeah, about this. And absolutely. she called me on it. Good for her. We had to go back. Yeah. Had to put the helmet on. But it should never have happened. That, well, I should have set a better example. And you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. So thank goodness nothing happened on that trip. But you now lucky. you'll be more aware. Absolutely. But absolutely. again, it's, is, it, is it true, not just when it comes to safety for our children or trying to keep our kids safe, that it's less what we say, more what we do? The children are looking towards us for, to set the example. So if we tell them, you have to wear your helmet, but mommy or daddy doesn't, it really is not set. And it's not to say, example. well, you're a kid, I'm not. That's a ridiculous right. explanation right. or response. And it doesn't mean that an adult couldn't get a brain injury as well as a child. And they do. Let's follow up on this. How many children, I hate to ask it this way, but die every year from these injuries? Well, in the United States, it's about 8,000 that die. Uh, we're not talking about the millions that are going to emergency rooms as well. So about 8,000 kids die a year. Globally, it's about a million kids a, a million. year that die as a result of an injury that could have been prevented. Underserved communities, urban communities in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, everywhere we're seeing. Worse? Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. Well, it's, it's the uh, where they live. Uh, higher density in traffic, lower socioeconomic um, housing, uh, a lot of dangers that they have presented to them that others may not. They don't have the resources to prevent the, uh, the incidents like bike helmets or car seats right. in many cases, and they don't have the information. Is it harder to help get the information out in underserved communities? Well, it... it it can be. Um, once they know about it, it's, it's a great find. I mean, if they go on safekids.org, there is a ton of free I information. Say, I, I hate to, our producers sure. are always three steps. There it is. I know. Safekids.org yeah. is up right now. There's a ton What's of information. There? They go on the site. What do they find? Tip sheets, videos that show you, kind of like a YouTube thing, where they right. show you exactly how to wear a bike helmet, exactly how to use a car seat, where to go to get a car seat if you need one, um, those types of things. But there's a wealth of information from birth till about 19. 19 years of age Safe kids, kids in this uh, consortium, funded by the government, where's your money come from? Well, we are supported by Johnson & Johnson. They are our founding sponsor uh, for Safe Kids Worldwide as well, uh, and, Safe, and Central Jersey Family Health Consortium. So we have grants that help provide our, our resources Let to do our program. Let me also clarify that J&J &J is a supporter of what we do Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Um, um, real quick, legalizing marijuana, mm -hmm. in the context of our children, which it would be illegal. Yeah. So why should that be an issue in terms of protecting our kids? Well, the, the aspect that we come to for uh, marijuana for children is basically proper storage of edibles for children so that they can have access to it, proper labeling, uh, making sure that, basically making sure children do not have access if there is marijuana in the home You're of, in any format. This. Oh, we're very concerned about it. It's the same thing with medicines and poisonings, making sure children don't have access to that to begin with. Define that, making sure, what are you talking about, locking up? The medicine cabinet? Out of reach of, of children, making sure if we, we do provide lock boxes for medications uh, so kid, kids can't get into it. The other thing, too, is proper storage. Uh, you may have mouthwash that looks like, or a, a windshield wiper fluid right. that looks like mouthwash. A child could drink either one of them. It looks the same. So you have to make sure your medications and your cleaning fluids are properly stored for, and for, labeled. Sorry for interrupting, uh, Caroline. Our children are older mm -hmm. than that infant stage, mm -hmm. but I remember all the gates. I remember mm -hmm. all those things we did. Mm -hmm. How valuable? 
Well, I'll give you an example. We did a, a special program where we went into homes and actually provided the resources to these families. And after a period of time, we went back to check to see if that home was any safer. That home was 55% safer than from when we first because? went in. Because they were, number one, provided with the knowledge. Number two, provided with the resources, like safety gates, like um, outlet covers, simple things. On, on, since where you're plugging in? Yeah. To put the outlet cover, that mm -hmm. makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So it was just simple, tangible solutions. Moving a, a throw rug so it's not a fall hazard. And as a result, those homes were, were safer just from simple knowledge that they received. Bottom line, we cannot keep our kids safe in every case, but there's a lot more that we could and should be doing, and also not just what we say. As I said, what we do matters. Carol Ann Giordelli, who is the director of Safe Kids New Jersey, Central Jersey Family Health Consortium. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Thank I'm you. I'm Steve Adubato. This is Think Tank. We'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are pleased to welcome Nancy Moran, Senior Pediatric Clinician, Behavioral Health and Cognitive Therapy at Summit Medical Group. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. So many young people dealing with or their parents are concerned about mm -hmm. anxiety. We'll talk about depression in a second. Define anxiety. Anxiety, we define anxiety as an overestimation of the danger and an underestimation of one's ability to cope with it. So it's worry. It's thinking that the world is a dangerous place, the world is unpredictable, and I might not be able to handle it. Depression is? Depression is more of a mood disorder. Depression is sadness, could be loss of interest, could go along with fatigue, loss of appetite, changes in sleep pattern. They can go together, but... So, sorry for interrupting, Nancy. Why do so many people, at least the ones who I talk to, when talking about younger people and, and adolescents, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, they throw it together, they throw them together. They're not necessarily together, but they can be, mm -hmm. co they can coexist. Correct. These are often co occurring disorders. Um, I think that a person who worries for a long period of time feels anxious in their life all the time can become really down and sad about that. Why does it seem, and I could be wrong, why does it seem that there are more and more young people either being diagnosed with anxiety mm -hmm. um, or we perceive that there are more? Which one is it, by the way? We definitely are seeing an increase in anxiety disorders, um, not as much as the increase in depression. Um, and we can make some guesses as to why that might be. Certainly social media is a factor. We are hearing, so? I think that kids don't get a chance to unplug. They're constantly tuned into what's happening with their peers. They're constantly feeling that they have to compare themselves to others. And there's a lot of pressure associated with that. How many um, likes? Who's checking me out? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? There's mm -hmm. a young woman we know who, frankly, was posting some pictures uh, on, on social media, said, I'm not going to say, who was making sure, was trying to make sure that the pictures that she was posting she was confident would get a lot of likes. Right. Which may not have been consistent with what she should be presenting to the world. Correct. Or her parents wanted her to present to the world. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Also, we're hearing from kids that the academic world is more competitive, feels more competitive. But I think the most important factor to talk about, because it's the one that we can control, is that it seems as though we live in a more dangerous world we almost have become a fearful society. I don't know if it's because we have a constant newsreel. Mm -hmm. Every terrible thing that happens is on our, pinged on our phone. Um, but as a result, parents are much more inclined to provide a lot of protections to kids. And so this means that kids are getting that subtle message that they're not safe in the world. And they're also not getting opportunities to figure out how to cope and how to learn strategies for dealing with adversity. So I think that over time creates an anxious child. Advice for parents. This is a, the good news is that parents can definitely help the situation from a young age when your child starts expressing worry or wanting to resist situations that seem uncomfortable such as a birthday party or even a soccer practice. If you acknowledge your child's feelings, support them, but then encourage them to face that situation anyway. 
the most natural thing in, a wor in the world for a parent to do is to reassure your child and say, you're going to be okay, I'll help you through it. And while that seems like a helpful thing in the moment, in the long run, it makes a child feel less capable of working it out on their own. Mm. So the better approach is to, once you've acknowledged your child's feelings, talk it through with them, ask them, how do you think you could deal with that if the worst thing happened? We've talked to some of our, my wife and I talked to some of the, our, the other parents. We have talked about our kids a lot, right? Mm -hmm. We're not the only ones. Sure. Want our kid to go to the best school. Got to get ready for the SAT. Got to get ready for the ACT. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't go to that great school, whether it's Ivy League or wherever else, you know, mm -hmm. things aren't going to work out for the kid. And that mm -hmm. kid is told that. Our kid didn't get into the special, advanced, whatever the course is. Mm -hmm. The kid knows that. Mm -hmm. Am I making too much of this stuff? It's there. It's real. But I think it's important to have the conversation to say, yeah, sometimes things don't work out the way you wanted them to. Now what? But what about putting pressure on the kid to get into that? Look, I'm trying to find the balance between having high standards, mm -hmm. um, expecting the most from our young, mm -hmm. from our kids, mm -hmm. but then putting so much pressure on them that, they're, that it's not healthy for them. To me, the difference is that you have a high standard versus an unrelenting standard. So meaning, do you strive to be the very best that you can be, but it's okay if you only make it 90% of the way? Or is there a very fixed and rigid outcome that is a must? When it's an unrelenting standard, there's a tremendous pressure. Too much. Too much. Too much. And, um, by the way, let's run this all the way to, to, to the end of the show, if we could. Um, because there's so much to talk about here. You got me curious, and more importantly, you got a lot of people watching right now. So, screen time. Go back to how you talked about screen time. Now I'm sitting there going, you want to limit screen time. We have an eight-year-old, two teenagers, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Different. Do you recommend that parents set screen times? Enforcing it's another story. Set screen times based on is age-appropriate screen time? 100%. The American Pediatric Association is recommending two hours a day. Kids are seeing way more and more, way more than that. Um, Absolutely, you have to monitor screen time. You have to put timers on. You have to designate times of the day where it's appropriate. You also have to monitor what they're doing on the screens. How do you do that? There's parental control. You have to be savvy. You have to be sa savvy with the technology. And I actually am a big advocate for holding out as long as possible to give that first cell phone. And when you do, having there be a contract. Hold on a second. We'll do the contract in a second. Okay. We did this. I know some other parents uh, have done this. You know, got the phone for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Got to make sure you can communicate with them. Mm -hmm. You don't disagree with that. Correct. But there's another side to that, isn't there? Right. That phone belongs to you. You're loaning it to your child for the purposes of his or her safety. You, res you reserve the right to check in and make sure that they're using it safely. You reserve the right to be their friend on social media up to a certain point. You know, this is when they're, they're learning. There are training wheels that have to go with this. And as your child grows and shows that they can handle it, they can use good judgment, you know, you can release some of those controls. So an 8-year-old versus a 16-year-old in terms of how you monitor it, same, different, or are there uh, privacy issues? No, it tot it's totally different, totally different. An 8-year-old doesn't have privacy. A 16-year-old, if they've shown good judgment, can begin to have some privacy. But only after they've demonstrated that they can use good judgment. The pressure on social media, and you're in your own little world, you know, you're down a rabbit hole and you forget. It's very easy. The best of kids have exercised poor judgment. And real quick on this, um, we've got about a minute and a half left. What I'm curious about is, we're not the only ones as parents. Your, your kid is on a screen. Mm -hmm. He or she is busy. You're getting some peace and quiet, and you go, hey, mm -hmm. listen, right. Right. I'm not going to question this. Right. That's too lazy, isn't it? Well, listen, I should say lazy, but it's yeah. not the best approach. But it, it's realistic. Yes, you know, that's why I, I think, put it out there. I think that's what happens in families. And, and also, I'm not saying screens are terrible and awful and we should never have them. But, you know, kids, kids deserve a little downtime and they can do something enjoyable or even educational. But it's just that it's limited and it's monitored. You know, it's so interesting. We were talking about 8-year-old, 16-year-old, but also our initiative put up, if we could, Nicole, our Right from the Start NJ initiative deals with... Uh, how we can help infants and toddlers. Mm -hmm. It's relevant there as well. 
They should not be on it at all. Say, say that again. In, infants and toddlers, up to three. I think it's up to two that they're very concerned about the neurological development of a child. Important stuff. This is, uh, boy, you've given us a lot to think about. And I'm not the only one as a parent. Nancy Moran, who is senior pediatric clinician, behavioral health and cognitive therapy at Summit Medical Group. And we are colleagues and friends with the folks over there. And they support our programming as well at Summit. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm Steve Adubato. Let's continue the conversation. So be sure you let us know exactly what topics you think that we should be covering on Think Tank. So check me out on Twitter, at Steve Adubato. But way more importantly, make sure you think for yourself. See you next week. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by PSE&G, Johnson & Johnson, NJM Insurance Group, NJIT, RWJ Barnabas Health, The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, and by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by ROINJ. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because with in-state, it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time, I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion.